Ralph was with me in my first race for governor. He was with me in blast. I mean, all you have to do is look at this view, and that's all you need to know that blast. I mean, all you have to do is look at this view, and that's all you need to know that we live in the best state in the country, hands down. I want to first say, look, when, we, when I was governor, we went through a lot of hard times. And when you go through hard times, you want to make sure you've got someone strong standing beside you. And we grow strong women in South Carolina. And one of the strongest ones we have is our great solicitor, Scarlett. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for representing us so well. And then we also have some tough, tough legislators. Now, we have some who cave to the crowd, and then you have some who are courageous and stand by principle. Those are few and far between. But I will tell you, I served with, I watched. We have a great freedom fighter in Senator Chip Campson. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate you so much. And I'm a big fan of freedom fighters. And when you talk about a freedom fighter, you can't find anyone tougher than Ralph Norman. <laughs> Ralph was with me in my first race for governor. He was with me in my second race for governor. He was the first one to jump on this team early on. He has faced a lot of resistance in DC. They have pushed back and Ralph's comment to them is, I don't care what y'all think. So God bless you, Ralph. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I look at this crowd, and this is everything that's great about South Carolina. And I think about all that we've been through together and all that we accomplished. If you think back to when I first became governor, times were tough. We had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare. And South Carolina was the butt of the jokes. And what did we do? We rallied. We got together. We got to work. And by the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes-Benz. We brought in Volvo, five international tire companies. They referred to us as the beast of the Southeast. We moved that 11% unemployment down to 4%. We passed pension reform, tort reform, the first body camera bill in the country. We paid down our debts. We cut taxes. We built up our coffers. And we acknowledged some truths. We said, if you've got to show picture ID to buy Sudafed, if you've got to show picture ID to get on a plane, you should have to show picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. We passed voter ID in South Carolina. We passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. And we held our elected officials to a higher standard. We made them have it had they had to start showing their votes on the record instead of hiding behind voice votes. We had them disclose who paid them so that all of you could see it. And we vetoed a half a billion dollars of their pet projects because taxpayer dollars didn't need to be going towards that. And by the time I left being governor, we were named the friendliest state in the country the one I'm most proud of, the most patriotic state in the country. And don't blame me for this one, the number two state in the country people were moving to. <laughs> and now I'm running for president and times are tough. We are $34 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. China owns some of that debt. And for the first time, we're paying more money in interest than we are in our defense budget. You know who's paying attention to that? Russia, China, and Iran. 
Something's got to give. And I would love to tell you that Joe Biden did that to us. And he's sending us down this socialism creep that we have to stop. But the truth is, our Republicans did that to us too. Out of the $34 trillion in debt, Donald Trump put us $8 trillion in debt in just four years. They passed that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill with no accountability that expanded welfare to where we now have 80 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. That's a third of our country. And did Republicans try and make it right? Nope. They doubled down and opened up pet projects and earmarks for the first time in 10 years, passing 7,000 of them last year. Now, the problem is, if no one is saying something is wrong with the spending, that's our money, and they continue to do it, right? With no sense of accountability whatsoever. So we think we've got to make sure that we take care of our economy, and I think the best way we take care of our economy, don't you think it's finally time we had an accountant in the White House? So what we'll do is we'll start by clawing back the $100 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are still sitting out there. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, let's go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud. One out of every $7 was spent fraudulently. If 8% of our budget is interest, quit borrowing. Cut up the credit cards. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor. Why is Congress the only group that refuses to balance a budget? We'll stop the spending, we'll stop the borrowing, we'll eliminate their pet projects, and I will veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. That will save us trillions. Then we're gonna take as many federal programs as we can and send them down to the state level. Think education, think welfare, think health care, think mental health will dramatically reduce the size of the federal government, but will empower people on the ground. That's the best way to customize it per state instead of having a Washington bureaucrat handle it. And we are watching the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We need to open up the middle class. So we're gonna cut taxes on the middle class, simplify the brackets, we're gonna eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax in this country, and we're gonna make small business tax cuts permanent. Small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. We've gotta start acting like it. And when you talk about Congress and their role, they have one job, one job, and that's to make sure they give us a budget on time. Do you know Congress has only given us a budget on time four times in 40 years? Think about that, four times in 40 years. You know what I say about that? If Congress doesn't get us a budget on time, Congress doesn't get paid, period. Don't you think it's finally time we had term limits in Washington, D.C.? Don't you think we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75? <laughs> now let me say this. I'm not being disrespectful when I say that. We all know people over 75 that can run circles around us. And then we know Joe Biden. <laughs> Congress has become the most privileged nursing home in the country. This is nothing to play with. We need to make sure that we have people who are focused. They're making decisions on our national security. They're making decisions on the future of our economy. We need people that are at the top of their game. And then let's talk about the border. I can't believe we would allow this to happen in the United States of America. Nine million illegal immigrants have come to that border. We've had more fentanyl cross the border last year that would kill every single American. Number one cause of death for adults 18 to 45, fentanyl. And don't think for a second China doesn't know what they're doing when they send it over. You know, when I was governor, 
One of the things we did, we passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. I think we take what we did in South Carolina and we go national with it. We need to do a national E-Verify program so that every business has to prove that the people they hire are in this country legally. We need to defund sanctuary cities once and for all. No more safe havens in America. Let's put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We'll go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. And instead of catch and release, we'll go to catch and deport. That is how we will stop what's happening in the border. But look at what happened last week. Congress actually had a border bill. And when you look at that border bill, it was good in terms of the fact that it strengthened asylum laws. And we have to do that. Three million illegal immigrants came in under the Trump watch because our asylum laws weren't strong enough. So we need to strengthen those. The weak part of the bill was it didn't have the Remain in Mexico policy, and it had a 5,000-person threshold. We don't even want a one-person threshold. We need to make sure we're vetting everybody. But the problem is Congress should have stayed there and not left until they came out with a strong border bill. But instead, they went home on vacation. But the other side of it is Trump went and told Congress not to pass anything until after the general election because he said it would hurt him. We can't wait one more day. We have got to secure our borders. Congress needs to get in a room, figure it out, pass a strong border bill, and Trump needs to stay out of it, period. And then, you know, growing up in Bamberg, South Carolina, my parents always taught me that you take care of those who take care of you. But I'm going to ask you if we're taking care of those who take care of us. Right now in America, over 35,000 of our veterans are homeless. One in three suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. If a veteran needs a doctor's appointment, on average, it takes 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they can go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they get a call to reschedule, and the clock starts all over again. It's shameful how we treat our veterans. Now, I'm the proud wife of a combat veteran who served in Afghanistan. And when Michael came back home to us, that was a lot of prayers answered. But that was the easy part. When he got home, life got hard. Michael couldn't hear loud noises. He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone, and the transition was tough. We can't just love our men and women when they're gone. We got to love them when they come back home, too. We do need to do more than just the two-week transition. Let's do telehealth so they can get the mental health care they need right when they need it. They should be able to go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. They've earned that right. And I think the best way to deal with the VA health care, I think every member of Congress should have to get their health care from the VA, and you watch how fast that gets fixed. It'll be the best health care you've ever seen, guaranteed. And speaking of military, let's talk about our national security. The world is on fire, literally. We've got a war in Europe. We've got a war in the Middle East. We've got North Korea testing intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of hitting the U.S. You've got China doing cyber attacks on our infrastructure. And you've got Russia now doing blinding satellites so that we can't see what missiles may come in or any infrastructure they may take out. But make no mistake, none of that would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that Michael and his military brothers and sisters who served there 
had to watch us leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that said to our friends. More importantly, what it said to our enemies. The focus of a president should be to prevent war, should be national security, should be keeping Americans safe. You need a leader that has moral clarity, that knows the difference between right and wrong. And you look at what Donald Trump said in Conway, South Carolina. He said that not only would he not defend our allies, he would encourage Putin to invade our allies. Now think about that for a second. Trump is siding with a thug where half a million people have died and been wounded because of Putin's invasion in Ukraine. Trump is siding with a dictator who kills his political opponents. Trump is siding with a tyrant who arrests American journalists and holds them hostage. Trump is siding with a guy who literally, he's gonna take their side, Putin's side, over the allies that stood with us after 9-11? Think about that. In that one moment that he went off the teleprompter, he put all of our allies at risk. He put our military men and women who are serving there in danger. And he emboldened Putin. And what's Putin done now? Now Putin's got soldiers that are going towards the Baltics. We have to remember that when a leader speaks, it matters. He didn't stop there. Then Trump goes on to mock my husband's military service. Now, Michael and I can take it. When you're in politics, it's open season. But you mock one member of the military. You're mocking every member of the military. And now this is a pattern Trump can't deny. First, he says that military members who lose their lives in service are suckers or losers. At Arlington National Cemetery, he asked what was in it for them. But the problem is, he's never known that sacrifice. We all know veterans. We all know people who've lost their lives in service. They don't do this for kicks and giggles. They do this because it's about something bigger than themselves. They sacrifice because they know freedom's not free. Donald Trump's never been near a uniform. He's never laid on the ground. The only harm he's ever come his way is a golf ball hitting him on a golf course. We know what we need to do to protect our country. We know what we need to do domestically to get us back on track. But now we've got to figure out what we're going to do tomorrow because that's where this all comes together. We can either do more of the same, and more of the same is not just Joe Biden, more of the same is Donald Trump, or we can elect a new generational leader that will lead us forward with solutions for the future. And think about what America's telling us. 70% of Americans have said they don't want a Trump-Biden rematch. Trump and Biden are the two most disliked politicians in America. 60% of Americans think Donald Trump's too old and Joe Biden's too old to be president. Both of those men have put us trillions of dollars in debt that our kids will never forgive them for. And are we really gonna say that we're at a point in time where the best we can do are two candidates in their 80s? When you need someone that can put in eight years of hard work day and night, getting the job done for the American people, no drama, no vendettas, just results. That's what we need in America.
know, I look at all of the chaos that's happened and think about it. The chaos under Joe Biden. It's not normal for you to have millions of illegal immigrants coming across the border and no one stop them. It's not normal where you spend more time in school focused on gender pronouns than you do reading and math. It's not normal to have all these wars around the world. But then you look at Donald Trump. It's not normal to mock the military. It's not normal to pay $50 million in campaign contributions to your personal court cases. It's not normal to side with Putin over our allies that served with us after 9-11. None of this is normal. And we can do better. But in order to do better, I'm assuming every one of you wants to see a change in our country. But in order to do that, we have to nominate someone that can actually win a general election. And you look at any one of these general election polls. You look at any one of these general election polls. We just had another one come out day before yesterday, a Marquette poll. Trump and Biden, margin of error. Most of the polls, Trump's down by five, he's down by seven. The best you'll ever see is margin of error. In that same Marquette poll, I defeat Joe Biden by 18 points. Do you know what that is? That's bigger than the presidency. That's House, that's Senate, that's governorships, that's school boards. But you win by that much. That's a double digit win. That's a mandate going into DC to stop the wasteful spending and get our economy back on track. That's a mandate to get our kids reading again and go back to the basics in education. That's a mandate to secure our borders with no more excuses. That's a mandate for law and order back in our cities. And that's a mandate for a strong America that we can all be proud of that prevents wars. Don't you want that? Because we could have that. But in order to have that, it's gonna take a lot of courage. Courage from everyone here. Courage for me to run. And courage for every one of you to know, don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't vote in this primary. It matters. You know, seven months ago, I dropped Michael off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they'd never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice their lives there, Shouldn't we be willing to fight for America here? Because we have a country to save. You know, I was watching TV a couple of days ago and I saw a commercial that Donald Trump had done. Funny how he says he's not worried about me, but he's running commercials. And in the commercials, every bit of it was a lie. So he said I was for open borders. He said, I wanted to raise taxes. Then he sent out a text message to everybody saying she's gonna cut social security. Well, none of that is true. But I was thinking, you know, if he's gonna lie about me, then I should tell the truth about him. So I think we should all ask him why he proposed a 25 cent per gallon gas tax hike when he was president. I think we should all ask him why he wants to raise taxes by 10% because he wants to put tariffs on every product from baby strollers to appliances. It would cost us $2,800 more per year. I think we should ask him why he's not gonna do anything with social security so when he leaves, everybody gets a 24% cut in their benefits. We need to be asking those questions. I would ask him, but he won't debate me. 
And I look at this election. It's been a year since I announced I was running. We had 14 people in this race. I defeated a dozen of the fellas. I just have one more fella I got to catch up to. They, they said we wouldn't make it to Iowa. We came within 1% of second place. They said in New Hampshire on election day, we were down by 30 points. We got 43% of the vote. And that night of New Hampshire, Donald Trump was unhinged. He had a total temper tantrum on stage if you watched it. He went on and on about revenge and my dress. The next day, he went and said, anybody that supports her is barred permanently from MAGA. We had a little fun with that. We sold t-shirts that said barred permanently. You've got one right there. We sold over 20,000 t-shirts. Then the next day, he pushes the RNC to name him the presumptive nominee. Now, we don't anoint kings in America. We believe that South Carolinians had the right to vote, as does every other state after that. That's who what we are. We are a democracy. We believe in elections. And then he had a few court cases where he lost some judgments. And he talked about being a victim. Now, the problem I had, whether it was the night of New Hampshire, or after the court cases, was at no point did he ever talk about the American people. He never talked about the fact that we were $34 trillion in debt. He never talked about the fact that only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. He never talked about the open borders. He never talked about the lawlessness in our cities. He never talked about the wars around the world. All he did was talk about himself. And that's the problem. It's not about him. It's about the American people. And when I look at the reason I'm doing this, I don't want my kids to live like this. I don't want your kids and grandkids to live like this. Think about what they've been through. They've been through COVID. They see all this debt. They don't know what it means for them. They wonder if they're ever going to be able to buy a home. They wonder if they're going to be able to get a job. They wonder how they're going to make ends meet. And they're fearful of wars. And all they hear and feel is anger, hatred, division. And then we wonder why there's so much stress, anxiety, and depression. Our kids deserve normal. They deserve to know what normal feels like. And I look, Joe Biden calls anybody that doesn't support him fascists. And Donald Trump calls anybody that doesn't support him vermin. That's not normal. I talked to you in the beginning about all the successes we had, and I'm incredibly proud of those. But now I want to remind you of the challenges we went through together, because it was a lot. While I was governor, we had multiple hurricanes. We had a thousand-year flood. We had Walter Scott shooting. We had a school shooting. And we had the shooting of nine amazing souls in Mother Emanuel Church. Any one of those could have brought us to our knees. After Walter Scott and the Mother Emanuel Church shootings, right prior to that, cities were up in flames. It was on the heels of Ferguson. Why didn't we go up in flames? We didn't have riots. We had vigils. We didn't have protests. We had prayer. The tone at the top 
matters. When we dealt with that situation after Mother Emanuel Church, I didn't judge anyone. I didn't pick who was right or who was wrong. That's not what a leader is supposed to do. You don't judge your people. Instead, you bring out the best in people and find a solution going forward. And we did that. We brought down a divisive symbol that had divided our state for too long. And through all of that, we showed our country and the world what strength and grace looks like. We did it over and over again through every crisis. Now it's time that we do it in our country because our country needs to heal. And our kids deserve to know what that feels like. But in order to do that, we've got some work to do. So I will tell you this, tomorrow is election day. Everybody needs to go out to vote and you gotta take five people with you. Now, all of us, believe it or not, in your friends and family, know a lot of general election voters. I want you to give them a message from me. In a general election, you're given a choice. In a primary, you make your choice. This is the time we make our choice. So make sure you tell your neighbors, your family, everybody, text them all, email them all, drag them to the polls as best as you can, because South Carolinians are gonna do what I know South Carolina always does. We know the power of our voice. We know what it means to make change, and we know what it means to get things done. And so I want you to get it done. And when you do that, I'm gonna do the same thing I promised you when you elected me governor twice. If you join me in this movement, if you join me in this fight, I will spend every single day proving to you that you made a good decision. God bless you. Thank you so much, Mount Pleasant. Thank you. God bless you. We have a great freedom fighter in center. We went through a lot of hard times. And when you go through hard times, team early on, he has faced a lot of resistance in DC. They have so have some tough, tough legislators. Now we have some who cave blessed. I mean, all you have to do is look at this view and that's all you need to know that in my second race for governor, he was the first one to jump on this team. Ralph was with me in my first race for governor. He was with me. You want to make sure you've got someone strong standing beside you. Is our great solicitor, Scarlett, thank you. God bless you. And I'm a big fan of freedom fighters. And when you talk about a freedom fighter, but I will tell you, I served with, I watched, stand by principle. Those are few and far between. But we live in the best state in the country. Hands down. Senator Chip Campson. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate you so much. Now, I want to first say, look, when, we, when I was governor, you can't find anyone tougher than Ralph Norman. Thank you for representing us so well. And then we all 